two more studies before we move on to another medicine. I'll let Johanna do this uh, uh, succinctly if we can, because one is a repeat of the Canadian study, the pivot, not a repeat, it was done first, the pivotal study, single agent penitumumab uh, versus best support of care in the refractory setting. But then I'd also like you to touch base or at least introduce with the so-called ASPECT trial of Cetux versus panitumumab, which I think is uh, fascinating data. So a couple of quick reviews. So with the uh, panitumumab versus best support of care really set the bar for looking at single agent anti-EGFR therapy. That study was, they allowed crossover once patients progressed. So you didn't see an overall survival benefit, but you also, but you did see the progression free survival benefit. I think most importantly, which Heinz alluded to earlier, was it started the KRAS study. Mm -hmm. So when you looked at those progression free survival curves, they were right on top of each other and then they split. And I always try to do teaching with fellows as I used to have and saying those are biomarker curves. When you see about a bunch of patients dropping off initially and then the split for benefit happening. And those initial patients that drop off are the ones that have the biomarker. Um, and so that teaches us a little bit about how to look for biomarkers. Um, the ASPECT study, I'm actually gonna talk to Heinz about it because he did see some information at ESMO uh, looking at that combination of cetuximab versus penitumumab. So just to set the study up, this was uh, frontline, head-to-head, KRAS wild type, um, cetux versus panitumumab. Um, the top shelf uh, results basically were no delta in response rate, no delta in, in outcome. You know, no delta in rash, which, uh, you know, there's a lot of debate about maybe one has more rash than the other. Um, uh, magnesium, I think, was a little different in toxicity, but they basically played the same in the same setting. So maybe with that backdrop, we'll go to how do you pick your EGFR agent. You live in Tennessee. I bet you have a preference. Yeah, we definitely do. So so with the issue with infusion reactions and cetuximab, it's never good to intubate a patient in the clinic. Right. Um, we tend to use more panitumumab outside of clinical trial. And you live in this Bible belt, basketball belt, infusion reaction belt. Exactly. Um, for, that's really a in the globe the one spot on the planet where this is really a, a major issue, at least uh, there. Heinz, how do you pick between the two? I prefer cetuximab for a couple of uh, reasons. Obviously, the efficacy on all the clinical trials did not show significant differences. But I, for my personal thing, I think that cetuximab has li little m less toxicity, particularly GI. And what about this, this Everest thing, though? Are you just underdosing? No, 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 no. But you know, the, it, when you say the skin toxicity is not this, is the same, that may be the intensity of grade three skin rash mm -hmm. or grade two skin rash are different. Patients who had both distinguish very easily. The ones I'm more worried about in addition to the skin rash is the GI toxicity when mm -hmm. you do it with chemo. So it's not a big difference like this, but it is. So I prefer, I, but I give Cetuxan every two weeks. How much parking at your place? Because you're every week or do you go every two weeks? <laughs> every two weeks. Every two weeks. So you Parking is free. Park. Okay. Parking's free? Yes. Okay. I'm gonna come get, it's not at my place anyway. It's so, Bali. Please so John, you have, we have to remember that the development of Cetuximab and Panitumumab were sequential. Mm. So, so Abgenics, who developed so yeah. panitumumab initially, then went to Im Immunex, and then went to Amgen. Abgenics knew that rash appeared to travel with activity, so they dosed panitumumab to rash. They probably chose too high a dose. I agree. And in fact, that's uh, why there is n not only the sense of, but in reality, I think there is a bit more rash with panitumumab. Uh, there are different bot. There are different molecules. One's human. One is is uh, is not. But in fact, we tend to favor, I tend to, yet for all of that, I tend to favor panitumumab a little bit because it's quite disruptive to patients and mostly to the doctors when uh, you have a, a, an infusion reaction. It's totally dis disarming. We see them infrequently, but if we see them, they're problematic. Marlon, yeah. where are you going? I mean, I think one thing I would like to add is that we don't know what much, how much difference we have in rash when you do the prophylactic treatment. That's true too. You know, so so who who amongst us is not using doxycycline or minocycline these days, and who is not telling patients to take precautions or or even start in with a hydrocortisone cream? Uh, so, so I, I think I had significant more concerns previously about using penitumumab. I have to say that the aspect data uh, suggests to me that if there's a difference in rash, it's probably a small difference. And, and I think with the use of a uh, step type of strategy, uh, th this becomes even less. And I think the other issue that I would like to throw in here is uh, I, I, I'm not really 
sure yet what to make out of a rash nowadays mm -hmm. because now when you start with a step type of strategy and you're starting with minocycline and doxycycline and how much do you push for a rash the other thing is intriguing data that had been presented uh, and I haven't seen it published but was in a poster session at ASCO previously that looks at the outcome within the prime study patients and what you look is that even within the KRAS mutant patients the patients who do have a rash have a much better outcome than patients who do not have a rash, which brings up a very important question. Is the instigation of a rash with an anti-EGFR therapy actually a prognostic indication that a patient is able to mount some type of form of immune response within, with chemotherapy rather than a dose to rash strategy? There may be something inherent with those patients they're gonna do better irrespective uh, so, so I think we need to do more work about the dose to rash. I'm not really too convinced at this point that we need to go up any higher. We have three studies to go, but a quick question. Um, if you failed on one EGF, do you try the other? I do not. I do. No. So no? I, I, I don't, but I think one important question is rechallenge. Rechallenge. I think that is a question that needs to be answered more appropriately prospectively. There's been prospective data that has been published looking at patients who had cetuximab in the first line setting, who had a good response lasting about six months, stable disease or more. Those patients had progressed on cetuximab and went on to another line of treatment after six months being off anti-EGFR therapy were rechallenged again with arenotecan cetuximab 50% response rate. I mean, this is really impressive. And I think, I think that that is, whether it's gonna be the same agent or another agent. And, and I mean, there are, there may be some differences with the EGFR. One more, wait, well. wait, we've got timing here. So uh, another point. <laughs> so if you're gonna use EGFR frontline, EGFR beyond progression? There is an ongoing study. I don't think anybody is doing it. But <laughs> the, the, Ital the Italians, <laughs> the CARPRA trial is actually testing it. They're doing Folferi Cetuximab and randomized to Folfox Cetuximab Continue right. versus Folferi, I think. About, I think I've always been about. amazed. I mean, this is in the HER2 family, or the HER family, right? And sir, clearly in, in breast cancer, it's HER2 beyond progression. Um, so I'll be very interested to, to see that study. Alan, we're going to move.